Hi, everybody. So it is time again for another chapter of Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by Marshall B. Rosenberg, PhD. I have an older version. It's second edition. Um, and it's very well loved. <laughs> okay, so we are digging into chapter seven with each other this evening or whenever you see this. You know, I went back and was watching kind of the end of my other one. And I always put everything on YouTube on double time because I'm neurodivergent and my brain processing feed is really super fast. And I actually learn things better on double time. And I didn't know that at first, like when someone, like, I would never even have thought of that, like, oh, that's way too confusing, but it actually like super works. So the reason I'm saying that right now, is just in case I have no idea who's watching this, but if you've never played around with like your settings on how, on the speed, I don't know, maybe you're somebody that likes something slowed down. Maybe you're someone that likes something sped up, but like play with it because it can like really change how you interpret information Um, because I'm not a reader. Like this is the only way I can even read is to read it to everybody else and kind of hear myself uh, through your eyes. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Anyway, total side note. Okay, chapter seven, receiving empathically. The last four chapters describe the four components of NBC, what we are observing, feeling, and needing, and what we wish to request to enrich our lives. Now we turn from self-expression to apply these same four components to hearing what others are observing, feeling, needing, and requesting. We refer to this part of communication process as receiving empathically. Uh, and the side note thing here, it says these two parts of NBC, expressing honestly and receiving empathically. Presence. Don't just do something. Stand there. <laughs> Empathy is a respectful understanding of what others are experiencing. The Chinese philosopher Chang Tzu, I probably said that wrong, stated that, I don't know if I said that wrong. Maybe you said it correctly, but often I butcher names. Anyway, stated that true empathy requires listening with the whole being. The hearing that is only in the ears is one thing. The hearing of the understanding is another. But the hearing of the spirit is not limited to any one faculty, to the ear or to the mind. Hence, it demands an empty or it demands the emptiness of all the faculties. Oh, that's cool. And when the faculties are empty, then the whole being listens. And I'm going to side note. That's why I'm doing this is for the side notes, because you guys could all just read this or get the auto tape or audio book. Right. So this is reminding me of a TikTok video I did once where I was walking in the uh, forest on a hike on a path. And it dawned on me. I can walk in the forest or I can walk as the forest. And just by putting that filter of as the forest on, oh my God, my whole entire day was completely different in it. It was like I was really feeling connected to everything. And I felt as if I was just almost connected to the path and that like it was nature that was pulling me around and it had nothing to do with like the little me. Anyway, total side note. Okay. So that's what this is reminding me of. Like, can I listen in that way is is that not what full connection with a communication should be like yeah have i been good at that no am i going to get better i hope okay when the faculties are empty then the whole being listens there is then a direct grasp of what of what is right there before you that could never be heard with the ear or understood with the mind. Um, in relating to others, empathy occurs only when we have successfully shed all pre preconceived ideas and judgments about them. The Austrian born Israeli philosopher Martin Buber describes this quality of presence that life demands to us. In spite of all similarities, every living situation has, like a newborn child, a new face that has never been before and will never come again. It demands of you a reaction that cannot be prepared for beforehand. It demands nothing of what 
is past. It demands presence, responsibility. It demands you. I guess that's what I it demands you. <laughs> the presence that empathy requires is not easy to maintain. The capacity to give one's attention to a sufferer is a very rare and difficult thing. It is almost a miracle. It, it is a miracle, asserts French writer Simone Weil. Nearly all those who think that they have the capacity to do uh, capacity do not possess it. Instead of empathy, we tend instead to have a strong urge to give advice <laughs> or reassurance. Do that too, and to explain our own position or feeling. Oh my God, that's like all of communication, right? <laughs> empathy on the other hand requires focusing full attention it's not like I can't do this like I do this too I just I'm noticing all the ways in which I can do better empathy on the other hand requires focusing full attention on the other person's message we give to others the time and space that they need to express themselves fully and to feel understood there's a buddhist saying that um, aptly describes this ability don't just do something stand there I love that. Don't just stand there, do something is usually don't just do something, stand there. Oh, I love that one. Kind of reminds me in the same bucket in my head is where the what everyone thinks is, well, seeing is believing as as an adage or whatever. And instead, it, it's actually believing is seeing. Those are in the same file now in my head buckets. Okay. Um, and now I forgot where we are. Okay, it's often frustrating for someone needing empathy to have us assume that they want reassurance or fix it advice. I received a lesson from my daughter that taught me to check whether advice or reassurance is wanted before offering any. She was looking in the mirror one day and said, I am as ugly as a pig. You're the most gorgeous creature God ever put on the face of this earth, I declared. She shot me a look of exasperation exclaimed, oh, daddy, and slammed the door as she left the room. I later found out that she was wanting some empathy instead of my um, ill-timed reassurance. I could have asked, are you feeling disappointed with your appearance today? My friend Holly Humphrey identified some common behaviors that prevent us from being sufficiently present to connect empathically with others. The following are examples of such obstacles. Advising. I think you should. How come you didn't uh, one-upping? That's nothing. Wait till you hear what happened to me. <laughs> Educating. This could turn into a very positive experience for you if you just... Consoling. It wasn't your fault. You did the best that you could. Storytelling. That reminds me of the time. Shutting down. Cheer up. Don't feel so bad. Sympathizing. Oh, you poor thing. Interrogating. When did this begin? Explaining. I would have called, but correcting. That's not how it happened. Oh, am I going to have a lot to say about this? And only, only this. I 100% like agree that all this is not empathic. You know, or there could be what are better ways. However, I don't know since they are just new research from the first time that this come up. Do we know that autistic people actually might fall in line? And I would love to know if they're gonna ever do a book on nonviolent communication with neurodivergent people. And here's why, I'm gonna go over this now because this is the whole point I'm doing it, is, okay, advising, totally agree, unless you're in a advising role, okay? Um, and, and sometimes if it's in a, an agreement where people are like coming and like wanting advice, I don't think that that is bad, but I understand how you need to be in that container. One-upping. Oh my God. So for one-upping, let's look at this. I need to make notes for tomorrow's meeting too. Okay. One-upping. Did you know that there is a profile of autism that is called PDA that has two different names. One of them is pathological demand avoidance and the other is persistent drive for autonomy. And if you think of a persistent drive of, for autonomy, it's almost like there is this leveling type of thing in communication there um, that 
is connected to how their nervous system is actually truly disabled. It's like an, a disability of the nervous system that causes cer certain communication to stick in ways that if something has any flavor of uh, uh, one-upmanship or like authority, the other person with this particular profile will usually do something that kind of says or does something that will level it back down. And that seems really combative, of course, to this other person. But what it is, is, is an overshoot to try to actually gain um, equality. Um, and people with the PDA profile of autism, one, can look like dicks when they're doing this, right? When they're doing that, when people don't understand. But then also, um, we are generally, I have this profile, we are also ones that want everything equal to. So the good part of our brains and systems that this is for, I think, as like a genetic kind of almost new school, uh, what would it be called? Um, evolutionary difference that's that's in neurodivergent people is I think that it's actually beneficial because it allows us to also see where injustice is and really fight for wanting uh more equality anyway the other one so one upping yes totally by the way I'm agreeing <laughs> with what the book is saying um in most all cases I just want to add some additional stuff because of how much I've learned about this, that society is just, I mean, this is coming out like this year. So it doesn't matter if someone's a PhD and has been for 40 years and has like a million things on their wall and they might not want to hear it from a TikTok and creator or whatever, but they, um, there's a lot of lived experiences of autistic people that I find a lot of value in. So, um, so yeah, I'd like to, that's why I'm doing this is to infuse like some of my other ideas. So cool. Educating. This could turn into a very positive experience for you if you just, yep. And again, same thing with the advice is like, if you're in an educational role, you're going to probably say things like that and that's okay, but create the container. Consoling. It wasn't your fault. You did the best that you could. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure that they're going to go into that probably more. Um, I'm so curious to hear what everybody's ideas are going to be on when that does feel okay for them or when they do like to hear things like that. Because I know it is, isn't it weird how all these sentences like at some times like don't have a charge and are cool, but then at other times it's like, oh my God, if you said that, it's just like cringy, right? Um, storytelling. That reminds me of a time. Okay. That's another one I need to talk about because... Um, with neurodivergent people, oftentimes we will have a limit or like limited, like I call them like little buckets in my head of certain things and how we actually remember stuff is by likening it to something we have already experienced. So this registers to a typical, or I mean, um, neurotypical people or holistic people as being super rude and as um, bringing it all back to them and we'll totally feel like a dismissal or like, like we will look really narcissistic sometimes when it's actually the opposite happening in that we're trying to relate it to something else that's happened so that we can take the information you're giving and like sprinkle it in with something else to see if it, you know, if it already has kind of a structure with it, if it has little variances of the structure, because it is connected to another structure we have, oh, you best believe that that will go inside there. It will be there and it will show the variance or the deviation <laughs> of what the initial one was, but it'll also show all the likening. And then you just try and be the next person that has something like that. Once we have a couple, because we're pattern seekers um, or noticers, then they'll be like, so sometimes they'll say something and it'll be like, okay. And then it'll go here and now I'll have two. So I'll just kind of take it almost as a given that maybe a lot of those overlapping steps, probably overlapping with that. But then where that variance is, I'll like go, okay. 
where are they going to come in that variance? And then they'll come in and I'll be like, okay, well, there's match the first one or well, there's match the second or well, there's match the third on the second part, right? I know I'm going so deep into a thing right now, but anyway, um, and then, you know, you do this 10,000 times in your life with a bunch of people, you start having really solid patterns and you're able, and you're able to remember all the people and things usually that created this scaffolding in your head and admire and love them and love them as being a part of your permanent thing, right? So the, the depths in which a lot of neurodivergent people are trying to relate and understand by likening. Ugh. Um, now you can tell energetically too, if someone is just narcissistic, not giving a shit, just being like, I think everyone is just kind of wounded, no matter what label we put on it, if they're, if they're not relating, relating well, but, but nonetheless, say they're having a bad day, this or that, and they don't like you. And maybe that's your thing or whatever. You're going to feel that energetically, but I'll bet you feel a lot of times energetically, like what someone is saying or their behavior is a little different than what their heart is saying. At least I noticed that anyway. Okay. Shutting down, cheer up. Don't feel so bad. Yeah, that's usually just the other person saying, uh, don't feel bad because if you feel bad, it will make me have an emotion that I don't feel comfortable or safe or know how to feel myself. Um, sympathizing, oh, you poor thing. I don't know a lot of people that like that. Do you like that? My partner, sometimes when I do something, he has this really cute way of going, oh, no. Like it, like, like I'm a kid, you know, oh no. And I think it is the absolute cutest thing in the world. I think it's like almost like stimmy in a way that it's like, I almost want to drop something just so he'll go, oh no, <laughs> cause I love it. But for the most part, if someone says, oh, you poor thing, I'll call it cringy. Um, interrogating, uh, when did this begin? Very, very logical. When did this begin? Tell me the facts. How did it go? I can see how that could not be un empathic sounding explaining I would have called but oh my god I do that all the time but I do that all the time because I'm a neurodivergent person and most of the time I feel very very misunderstood and I have to like over explain myself all the freaking time so again I am so glad that I am able to do this and dear Marshall Rosenberg PhD I would love to see your latest version of your book have some upgrades with a good month or so studying with late diagnosed and especially feminine energy presenting uh, people uh, because there's a whole different way that a lot of us were socialized that just is now coming out. Um, so I think there's much to learn and there's different things that you can maybe add. Um, if only it's, it's not saying like that it's ideal and that we have to change everything, but boy, wouldn't it be great if the whole kind of world or everyone that read this book would be able to know that not everybody is able to do this. Interesting. And then correcting would be, that's not how it happened, which of course is going to like trigger gaslight feeling, right? Okay. <clears throat> so moving on. In this book, when bad, th or in his book, when bad things happen to good people, uh, Robbie, R Robbie, is it Rabbi or Robbie? Harold Kushner describes how painful it was for him when his son was dying to hear the words people offered that were intended to make him feel better. Even more painful was his recognition that for 20 years, he had been saying the same things to other people in similar situations. Believing that we have to fix situations and make others feel better prevents us from being present. Those of us in the role of counselor or psychotherapist are particularly susceptible to this belief. Once, when I was working with 23 uh, mental health professionals, I asked them to write word for word how they would respond to a client who says, I'm feeling very depressed. I just don't see any reason to go on. I collected the answers that they had written down and announced. I am now going to read out loud what each of you wrote. Imagine yourself in the role of the person who expressed the feeling of depression and raise your hand after each statement if you hear that it gives you a sense that you have been understood. 
hands were raised only to three of the 23 responses. Questions such as, when did this begin, constituted the most frequent response. They give the appearance that the professional is obtaining the information necessary to diagnose and then treat the problem. In fact, such intellectual understanding of a problem blocks the kind of presence the empathy that empathy requires. When we are thinking about people's words, listening to how they connect to our theories, we are looking at people. We're not with them. Oh, I'm so, I'm so like subject to that. It's interesting. Like some people will say that I listen with the most amount of empathy and can understand them. But I totally know that sometimes I am going through my patterns and do have things that I know can help them in their lives. And that's why I put myself in the container of teacher and advisor and make that very clear coming in as the container. And then it's received well. But yes, going into just any other conversation uh, outside of that role. And I noticed that outside of the that container, it is devastating. So um yeah. So let's just say I'm in the right business or right agreements with people wanting to communicate with me. <laughs> um, when we are thinking about people's words, listen, to, okay, I already said that we are looking at people. We're not with them. The key ingredient of empathy is presence. We are wholly present with the other party and what they are experiencing. This quality of presence distinguishes empathy from other mental understanding or sympathy. While we may choose at times to sympathize with others by feeling their feelings, it's helpful to be aware that during the moment that we're offering sympathy, we are not empathizing. Listening for feelings and needs. In NVC, no matter what words people use to express themselves, we listen for their observations, feelings, and needs, and what they are requesting to enrich their life. Imagine having loaned your car to a new neighbor who had approached you with a personal emergency. When your family finds out, they react with intensity. You're a fool for having trusted a total stranger. The dialogue on the next page shows how to tune into the feelings and needs of the family members in contrast to each other. Or, or I'm sorry, let me say that again. The dialogue on the next page shows how to tune into the feelings and needs of the family members to or family members in contrast to either one blaming yourself by taking the message personally or two blaming and judging them. In this situation, it's obvious what the family is observing and reacting to the lending of the car to a relative stranger. In other situations, it may not be so clear. If a colleague tells us you're not a good team player, we may not know what he or she is observing. Although we can usually guess at the behavior that might have triggered such a statement. The following exchange from a workshop demonstrates the difficulty of focusing on other people's feelings and needs when we are accustomed to assuming responsibility for their feelings and to taking messages personally. The woman in this dialogue wanted to learn to hear the feelings and needs behind uh, behind certain of her husband's statements. Feelings and needs behind certain of her. Huh. This is literally how it's written. The woman in this dialogue wanted to learn to hear the feelings and needs behind certain of her husband's statements. Hmm, I've never heard a sentence, a sentence like that. Anyway, I suggested that she guess at his feelings and needs and then check it out with him. Husband's statement. What good does talking to you do? You never listen. Woman. Are you feeling unhappy with me? Uh, Marshall. When you say with me, you imply that his feelings are the result of what you did. I would prefer for you to say, are you unhappy because you were needing blah, 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 and not, are you unhappy with me? Oh, that's a good one. I like that. It would put your attention on what's going on with within him and decrease the likelihood of you taking the message personally. Oh, I'm going to really have to practice this chapter. This is like literally what, something that happened tonight at dinner with my partner. 
Um, so I'm going to reread that in a minute. Uh, but what would I say? The woman says, are you unhappy because you, because you what? Marshall says, get your clue from the content of your husband's message. What good does talking to you do? You never listen. What is he needing that he's not getting when he says that? Woman, trying to empathize with the needs being expressed through her husband's message. Are you feeling unhappy because you feel like I don't understand you? Marshall says, notice that you are focusing on what he's thinking and not what he's needing. I think you'll find people to be less threatening if you hear what they're needing rather than what they're thinking about you. Oh my God, that's such a good one too. List, um, I'm going to highlight that. If you hear what they are needing rather than what they are thinking about you. Oh my God, I'm going to like scream that to my partner tonight. I'm just going to you need to start doing this. <laughs> Is that empathy? Do you think he'll, that'll take, take go over well with him? <laughs> uh, woman says, trying again, are you feeling unhappy because you are needing to be heard? Oh my God, isn't the rearrangement of those so much better? Holy crap. So the first one was, are you feeling unhappy with me? The second one was, are you unhappy because you, and the third one is, are you feeling unhappy because you are needing to be heard? Oh my God, that's so much better. And then Marshall says, that's what I had in mind. Does, does it make a difference for you to hear him this way? Woman, definitely a big difference. I see what's going on for him without hearing that I had done anything wrong. <gasps> this is something I'm going to have to put on the fridge. Okay, paraphrasing. After we focus our attention and hear what others are observing, feeling, and needing, and what they are requesting to enrich their lives, we may wish to reflect back by paraphrasing what we've understood. In our previous discussion on request, chapter six, we discussed how to ask for a reflection, how or now we will look at how to offer it to others. If we have accurately received the other person's message, our paraphrasing will confirm this for them. If on the other hand, our paraphrase is incorrect, the speaker has an opportunity to correct us. Another advantage of our choosing to reflect a message back to the other party is that it offers them time to reflect on what they have said and an opportunity to delve deeper into themselves. NVC suggests that our paraphrasing take the form of questions that reveal our understanding while eliciting any necessary corrections from the speaker. Questions may focus on A, what others are observing, example. Are you reacting to how many evenings I was gone last week? B, how others are feeling and the needs generating their feelings. Example, are you feeling hurt because you would have liked more appreciation of your efforts than you received? C, what others are requesting. Example, are you wanting me to tell you my reasons for saying what I did? Oh my God, I don't think I've once ever asked somebody if they wanted to know my reasons. Especially if, like, I think they're mad. I'm like, let me tell you the reasons right away because I don't want you to be mad at me. These questions require us to sense what's going on within other people while inviting their corrections. Should we have sensed incorrectly? Notice the difference between these questions and the ones below. What did I do that you're referring to? How are you feeling? Why are you feeling that way? What are you wanting me to do about it? Big difference. <laughs> the second set of questions ask for information without first sensing the speaker's reality. Oh my God. I just got goosebumps on how much I can't wait to talk to Patrick about this. Though they may appear to be the most direct way to connect with what's going on within the other person. Whoops. I found that the questions like these are not the safest route to obtain the information we seek. 
Many such questions may give speakers the impression that we're a school teacher examining them or a psychotherapist working on a case if we do decide to ask for more information in this way. However, I found that people feel safer if we first reveal the feelings and needs within ourselves that are generating the question. Thus, instead of asking someone, what did I do? We might say, I'm frustrated because I'd like to be clearer about what you're referring to. Would you be willing to tell me what I've done that leads you to see me in this way? While this step may not be necessary or even helpful in situations where our feelings and needs are clearly conveyed by the context or tone of voice, I would recommend it per particularly during moments when the questions we ask are accompanied by strong emotions. I'm trying to think of what the best way to do this is like flashcards or like on a whiteboard in the kitchen downstairs, like how am I going to remember this, right? I think that's the biggest thing when people get into this is they see the value in the book and there's, I know workbooks and all these other things of practice, but it like almost makes it seem like there's so many rules. And at least again, for neurodivergent people, I want to do this so well and right that I almost am like a deer in the headlights on attempting, you know, because it matters to me. Okay. Where was I? How do we determine if an occasion calls for us to reflect people's messages back to them? Certainly, if we are unsure that we have accurately understood the message, we might use prayer phasing to elicit a correction to our guests. But even if we are confident that we've understood them, we may sense the other party wanting confirmation that their message has been accurately received. They may even express this desire overtly by asking, is that clear or do you understand what I mean? At such moments, hearing a clear paraphrase will often be more reassuring to the speaker than hearing simply, yes, I understand. Even though, oh, I love that word. Yeah, yes, I understand. When I when someone's looking at me and they say that and it feels genuine, I swear that like aphrodisiac, I mean, just goosebumps everywhere. I just, oh, do is be mis or be understood and you see even started saying misunderstood because i've said the word misunderstood so many times maybe that's me spelling misunderstanding into the universe and i need to not say the word misunderstanding so much side note <laughs> okay for example, shortly after participating in an NBC training, a woman volunteer at a hospital was requested by some nurses to talk to an elderly patient. We've told this woman she isn't that sick and that she's she'd get better if she took her medicine, but all she does is sit in her room all day long repeating, I want to die, I want to die. The volunteer approached the, I don't know why I did that voice. <laughs> That's just how I was picturing it. Anyway, the volunteer approached the elderly woman and as the nurses had predicted, found her sitting alone, whispering over and over, I want to die. I want to die. So like she's a neurodivergent person at the end of her life, just being like, I can't freaking take it anymore. Sorry. I just had to make light of that. Shouldn't have probably made light of her death, but that's also part of being autistic is sometimes you just say things and then like the repercussion doesn't quite catch up in enough time. And I'm not going to delete a good, what, 40 minutes or whatever of this so far. I don't know. I'm, I also have time blindness. So I have no freaking idea how long I've done this for. <laughs> but I also love myself. Damn it. Damn it. I do. So you would like to die, the volunteer empathized. Surprised, the woman broke off her chant and appeared relieved. I would feel that way too. She began, because then I'd feel like someone's listening to what I'm saying. Yeah. She began to talk about how no one understood how terrible she was feeling. The volunteer continued to reflect back the woman's feelings. Before long, such warmth had entered their dialogue that they were sitting armed, arms locked around each other. Later that day, the nurses questioned the volunteer about her magic formula. The elderly woman had started to eat and take her medicine and was apparently in better spirits. Although the nurses had tried to help her with advice and reassurance, it wasn't until her interaction with the volunteer that this woman received what she was truly needing connection with another human being who could hear her profound despair. All right, a little side note here too. Um, there's, 
there's a like when it comes to like school shooters and that kind of stuff or people that are in that kind of pain um i've learned from uh, i think it was a teal swan video actually that came out um and regardless of your thoughts on her or her material hear me out on this in that um she was talking about how like why would someone ever do this how could someone be in that much pain why would they do this and that there's some actual thing about being so misunderstood in their internal and subjective pain that it is actually a vibrational increase for the shooter to basically want to shoot all the people that wouldn't listen to them in their life because um for a moment it was kind of that equalizing thing to where they'll be able to see other people actually with them in their pain more externally because they couldn't get into the subjective reality. And her theory is that if more people were doing stuff like this and we could actually talk, find ways into the subjective reality of teens more that a lot less of this would be happening. So thank you books like this. Okay. Um, the the volunteer continued to reflect back the women's feelings before long such warmth enter their dialogue they were sitting arms locked around each other said that there are no infallible guidelines regarding when to paraphrase but as a rule of thumb it is safe to assume that uh did you know that sorry this is again rule of thumb actually was how big of a stick you could beat your wife with or maybe it's kids, wife, whatever. But that term, uh, yeah, isn't that crazy? That um, r the rule of thumb originally was like that. Uh, at least, I mean, you can look it up. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But that's that's what I heard. And I was like, oh, mortified. Isn't it funny how just like every time we do a new chapter, there's going to need to be another edition now to like take that out. <laughs> also, though, like um, I learned more recently, too, that... Um, we're not hearing from the peanut gallery or that kind of stuff is also very like derogatory in that the peanut gallery was where um like black people or like slaves would be and so it's like anytime we say that it's kind of like saying yeah we don't want to hear what a person of color wants to say about this and that is certainly not something that I want to be spreading but you know you don't know until you know and then when you know you can do better so that's what we're doing here all right. Oh, I totally lost my whole page here. Okay, here we go. Where's the rule of thumb here? Okay. But as a rule of thumb, it is safe to assume that speakers expressing intensely emotional messages would appreciate our reflecting these back to them. When we ourselves are talking, uh, we can make it easier for the listener if we clearly signify when we want or don't want our words to be reflected back to us. There are occasions when we may choose not to verbally reflect someone's statements out of respect for certain cultural norms. For example, a Chinese man once attended a workshop to learn how to hear the feelings and needs behind his father's remarks. Because he could not bear the criticism and attack he continually heard in his father's words, this man dreaded visiting his father and avoided him for months at a time. He came to me 10 years later and reported that his ability to hear feelings and needs had radically transformed his relationship with his father to the point where they now enjoy a close and loving connection. Although he listens for his father's feelings and needs, or I'm sorry, although he listens for his father's feelings and needs, however, he does not paraphrase what he hears. I never say it out loud, he explained. In our culture, to direct talk to a person about their feelings is something they're not supposed to do. What? what? I would not want to go to China if that's the case in their culture. No offense, Chinese people. Like, just the, you know, how you're, I mean, believe me, they're like, trust me, you Americans, you, no offense. Yeah, I don't want to be. <laughs> Anyway, okay, but yeah, like feelings, holy crap, I didn't know that. Um, Because I am highly emotional <laughs> and I would not do well there, I feel like. 
Um, but thanks to the fact that I no longer hear what he says as an attack, but as his own feelings and needs, our relationship has become enorm enormously wonderful. So you're never going to talk directly to him about feelings, but it helps to be able to hear them, I asked. No, now I think I'm probably ready, he answered. Now that we have such a solid relationship, if I were to say to him, Dad, I'd like to be able to talk directly to you about what we were feeling, I think he, he just might be ready to do it. Well, that's good. Go China. Uh, yeah, keep spreading it, whoever's that anecdote's about. When we paraphrase, the tone of voice we use is highly important. When they hear themselves reflected back, people are likely to be sensitive to the slightest hint of criticism or sarcasm. Oh my God, that's so true. They are like, <laughs> you can easily change your sentence back, like in the worst way possible if you wanted to. Like, I can't think of an example, but I'm laughing at all the ideas of times where something has been repeated back, but like so icky, you know? Um, they're likewise negatively affected by a declarative tone that implies that we are telling them what is going on inside of them. My partner hates that, even though I can feel it. <laughs> I know what is going on with him. He's like in such denial, but whatever. Um, I'm also a physical empath. I've been reading patterns my whole life. And I also know when I'm like, I can tell when I'm projecting too. Like I will admit it, like I feel, uh, whatever. I guess I need to be more humble there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to repeat this. They are likewise negatively affected by a declarative tone that implies that we're telling them that we know what's going on inside of them. If we're consciously listening for other people's feelings and needs, however, our tone communicates what we're asking whether we have understood, not claiming that we have understood. We also need to be prepared for the possibility that the intention behind our paraphrasing will be misinterpreted. Don't pull any of that psychology crap on me, we may be told, should this occur. We continue our effort to sense the speaker's feelings and needs. Perhaps we see in the case that the speaker doesn't trust our motives and needs more understanding of our intentions before he can appreciate hearing our paraphrases. As we've seen, all criticism, attack, insults, and judgments vanish when we focus attention on hearing the feelings and needs behind a message. The more we practice in this way, the more we realize a simple truth. Behind all those messages we've allowed ourselves to be intimidated by are just individuals with unmet needs appealing to us to contribute to their well-being. When we receive messages with this awareness, we never feel dehumanized by what others have to say to us. We only feel dehumanized when we get trapped in derogatory images of other people or thoughts of wrongness about ourselves. As author and mythologist Joseph Campbell suggested, what will they think of me must be put aside for bliss. Take that in, take a breath. What will they think of me must be put aside for bliss. I didn't mean to have like a hiccup in the middle of that. Beautiful quote. <laughs> we begin to feel this bliss when messages previously experienced as critical or blaming begins to be seen for the gifts they are. Opportunities to give to people who are in pain. If it happens regularly that people distrust our motives and sincerity when we paraphrase their words, we may need to examine our own intentions more closely. Perhaps we're paraphrasing and engaging the components of NBC in this um, me mechanistically way without maintaining mechanistically. How do you say mechanically or mechanicalistically? I've never said that before. Mechanis mechanistically way without maintaining clear consciousness of purpose. We might ask ourselves, for example, whether we are more intent on applying the process correctly or correctly than connecting with the human being in front of us. Okay, I'm gonna need to highlight that because that's what I wanna talk about tomorrow night at book club because there are, I think, gonna be so many of us that are feeling, oh my God, we have to do this the right way. 
And it is becoming that idea of like, oh my God, I have to get a book. Do I need flashcards and all this kind of stuff? And I think what trumps all of that is our ability to want to be listening and in their subjective reality and wanting to do well, I think is going to transfer more than anything else with this, in my opinion. Um, some people resist paraphrasing as a waste of time. <laughs> One city administrator explained during a practice session, I'm paid to give facts and solutions, not to sit around doing psychotherapy with everyone who comes into my office. This same administrator, however, was being confronted by angry citizens who would come to him with their passionate concerns and leave dis dissatisfied for not having been heard. Some of these citizens later confided to me, when you go to his office, he gives you a bunch of facts, but you never know whether he's heard you first. When that happens, you start to distrust his facts. Paraphrasing tends to save rather than waste time. Makes sense. I would think so. Studies in labor management negotiations demonstrate that the time required to reach conflict resolution is cut in half when each negotiator agrees before responding to accurately repeat what the previous speaker had said. I recall a man who was initially skeptical about the value of paraphrasing. He and his wife were attending an NBC workshop during a time when their marriage was beset by serious problems. During the workshop, his wife said to him, you never listen to me. I do too, he replied. No, you don't, she countered. See, that's the example right there, right? Because if he was empathic, he would like be taking in, oh, so you feel like I don't listen to you? Tell me more, right? Anyway. Um, I addressed the husband. I'm afraid you just proved her point. Oh, okay. <laughs> I jumped in too soon. Um, you didn't respond in a way that lets her know that you were listening to her. He was puzzled by the point I was making. So I asked for permission to play his role, which he gladly gave me because he wasn't having too much success with it. His wife and I then had the following exchange. She says again, you never listen to me. Marshall then says in the role of the husband, sounds like you're terribly frustrated because you would like to feel more connected when we speak. The wife was moved to tears when she finally received this confirmation that she had been understood. I turned to the husband and explained, I believe that this is what she's telling you that she needs, a reflection of her feelings and needs as a confirmation that she's been heard. The husband seemed dumbfounded. Is that all she wanted? He asked, incredulous, that such a simple act could have such a strong impact on his wife. I just want to be like, come in and listen to this right now. This is exactly what I need. <laughs> He's read this before too, um, but a long time ago. Uh, yeah, we both need a really good sit down with these and see there's so much ways I can improve my communication. Oh my God. It's like the more you learn on this, the more you're like, oh crap. Okay. <clears throat> To, to which I'm going to bite something. Sorry if that's a weird thing for you. And stuck to my lipstick. Skin. Oh, and noises. Oh, if you're neurodivergent and like probably hating me right now, I'm probably not. I'm going to try not to make any other mouth noises if I can help it. Okay. A short time later, he enjoyed the satisfaction firsthand when his wife reflected back to him a statement that he had made with great emotional intensity. Savoring her paraphrase, he looked at me and declared, it's valid. It is a poignant experience to receive concrete evidence that someone is empathically connected, connecting to us or connected to us. Sustaining empathy. I recommend allowing others the opportunity to fully express themselves before turning our attention to solutions or requests for relief. I need to, re I trailed off. I need to read that again. I recommend allowing others the opportunity to fully express themselves before turning our attention to solutions or requests for relief. Yeah. I think sometimes too, when that happens, I feel, this is my experience is it's been that it seems like Sometimes if people are off on a thought reel, they can be on that thought reel for years, but 
have I used every single one of these tools? And maybe if I paraphrase parts of, but if you paraphrase every single part of somebody's reel, oh, you don't have to, my guides are coming in now, hold on. You don't have to paraphrase everything. You just have to find the emotional parts of it like I already have been doing, but I need to paraphrase something more on that, on that. I need to be pointing more there. Okay. There's so much, I can't explain what's happening in my head. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. When we proceed too quickly to what people might be requesting, we may not convey our genuine interest in their feelings and needs. Oh, I am so interested. You wouldn't believe seriously. Like I so care about people. It just doesn't always register that way. But that's why, because I have improvements I can do here. Okay. Uh, we may not convey our general interest, genuine interest in their feelings and needs. Instead, they may get the impression that we're in a hurry to either be free of them or to fix their problem. Oh, I know so many people are probably going to think that of me. Furthermore, an initial, mess an initial message is often like the tip of the iceberg. It may be followed by yet unexpressed, but related and often more powerful feelings. By maintaining our attention on what's going on within others, we offer them a chance to fully explore and express their interior selves. We would stem this flow. It would stem this flow? We would stem this flow if we were to shift attention too quickly, either to the request or to our own desire to express ourselves. Okay. Suppose a mother comes to us saying, my child is impossible. No matter what I, no matter what I tell him to do, he doesn't listen. We might reflect her, reflect her feelings and needs by saying, it sounds like you're feeling desperate and would like to find some way of connecting with your son. Such a paraphrase often encourages a person to look within. If we have accurately reflected her statement, the mother might touch upon other feelings. Maybe it's my fault. I'm always yelling at him. See, like, which is what I'm doing right now. If you notice, I'm stopping all the time because this is coming up like, oh, shit, I did that or whatever. Kind of funny. Um, as a listener, we would continue to say with the feelings and needs being expressed uh, and say, for example, are you feeling guilty because you would like to have been more understanding of him than you have been at times? If the mother continues to sense understanding in our reflection, she might move further into her feelings and declare, I'm just a failure as a mother. Oh, I just want to hug this mother right now. We continue to remain with the feelings and needs being expressed. So you're feeling discouraged and want to relate differently to him. We persist in this manner until the person has exhausted all of her feelings surrounding the issue. Okay, so that's the way to kind of link it in with it. Yeah, which is kind of that thing I was doing in my head. I feel like it's setting that up to let the floodgates open a little bit more. What evidence is there that we've adequately adequately empathized with the other person? God, I'm so disjointed. Sorry, y'all. What evidence is there that we've adequately empathized with the other person? First, when an individual realizes that everything going on within has received full empathic understanding, they will experience a sense of relief. We can become aware of this phenomenon by noticing a corresponding release of tension in our own body. A second, even more obvious sign is that the person will stop talking. If we are uncertain as to whether we have stayed long enough in the process, we can always ask, is there more that you wanted to say? When pain block, I try to do that, but I know I, I'm so, I have so much to do on this. Oh my God. When pain blocks our ability to empathize, it is impossible for us to give something to another if we don't have it ourselves. Likewise, if we find ourselves unable or unwilling to empathize despite our efforts, it is usually a sign that we are too starved for empathy to be able to offer it to others. Sometimes if we, are op if we openly acknowledge that our own dis distress is preventing us from responding empathically, the other person may come through with the empathy we need. At other times, it may be necessary to provide, God, I have to circle that. God, like just that right there, that does, that gives freedom, that helps with the neurodivergent thing. That just gives a lot of freedom to be able to check in, like, and then be able to just sweetly say, like, hey, I know you need me to see your subjective reality better than I'm able to do right now. 
your feelings are valid and I want to be able to hold space with you with them, but I've got my own stuff going on right now with my nervous system. And this isn't the best time for me to be able to do that, but it doesn't mean that I don't care. And I'm happy to circle back on this. And I really do hope you find somebody else that can help you is what I needed to practice. Apparently <laughs> I'm going to get a little sip. I thought I brought my water up. No, oh, no water. Okay, I'm almost done. I'll get it for the next chapter. At other times, it may be necessary to provide ourselves with some emergency first aid empathy by listening to what's going on in ourselves with the same quality of presence and attention that we offer to others. Oh, and that's what I do with mirror work. So nice to be able to say sweet things to ourselves. The former United Nations Secretary General Dag Hammers. Hammersault, <laughs> I'm not going to get that, once said, the more faithfully that you listen to the voice within you, the better that you will hear what is happening outside. Ain't that the truth? If we become skilled in giving ourselves empathy, we often experience in just a few seconds a natural release of energy that then enables us to be present with the other person. If this fails to happen, however, we have a couple of other choices. We can scream nonviolently. I recall spending three days meditating between two gangs that had been killing each other off. One gang called themselves Black Egyptians, the other East Street Louis Police or Saint, East St. Louis Police. <laughs> it was kind of East Street, it looked like, but East St. Louis Police Department. The score was two to one, a total of three dead within a month. After three tense days trying to bring these groups together to hear each other and resolve their differences, I was driving home and thinking how I never wanted to be in the middle of a conflict again for the rest of my life. The first thing I saw when I walked through the back door was my children entangled in a fight. I had no energy to empathize with them and I screamed nonviolently, hey, I'm in a lot of pain. Right now, I really do not want to deal with your fighting. I just want some peace and quiet. My older son, then nine, stopped short, looked at me and asked, do you want to talk about it? If I were able to speak our pain nakedly without, if we are able to speak our pain nakedly without blame, I find that even people in distress, in distress are sometimes able to hear our need. Of course, like their kids. Yeah, he's good. Of course, I wouldn't want to scream. What's the matter with you? Don't you know how to behave any better? <laughs> I just got home after a rough day or insinuate in any way that their behavior is at fault. I scream nonviolently by calling attention to my own desperate needs and pain in this moment. Okay. So that thing that he came in and said earlier was his screaming. What was it again? Hey, I'm in a lot of pain right now. I do not really want to deal with your fighting. It still seems like that's putting it on them a little bit, but not as much as the other one. And I want some peace and quiet. He's asking what his needs are. Okay. Um, if, however, the other party is also experiencing such intensity of feelings that they can neither hear nor leave us alone, the third recourse is to physically remove ourselves from the situation, which makes me panic. <sighs> We give ourselves time out and the opportunity to acquire the empathy we need to return to a different, different, in a different frame of mind. Summary, empathy as a respectful understanding of what others are experiencing. Empathy is, <laughs> empathy is a respectful understanding of what other others are experiencing. Instead of offering empathy, we, uh, ha we often have a strong urge to give advice or reassurance and to explain our own position or feeling. Empathy, however, calls upon us to empty our mind and listen to others with our whole being. In NBC, no matter what words others may use to express themselves, we simply listen for their observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Then we may wish to reflect back, paraphrasing what we have understood. We may say with empathy, allowing others the opportunity to fully express themselves before we turn attention to solutions or requests for relief. We need empathy to give empathy. When we sense ourselves being defensive or unable to empathize, we need to A, stop, breathe, give ourselves empathy, B, scream nonviolently, or C, take a time out. NBC in action. A wife connects with her dying husband. 
A patient has just been diagnosed with an advanced state of lung cancer. The following scene is at, is at home involving a visiting nurse, the patient and his wife. Represents a last opportunity for him to connect emotionally with his wife and discuss his dying before being admitted to the hospital. The wife begins the conversation with the nurse by complaining about the physical therapist who is part of the home health care team assigned to her husband's care. Wife. She's a bad therapist. Nurse listening empathically to what the wife is feeling and wanting. Are you feeling annoyed and wanting to see a different quality of care? Wife, she doesn't do anything. She made him stop walking when his pulse got high. Nurse, continuing to hear the wife's feelings and wants. Is it because you want your husband to get better and you're scared if the physical therapist doesn't push him, he won't get stronger? Wife starts to cry. Yes, I'm so scared. Nurse, are you scared of losing him? Wife, yes, we've been together for so long. Nurse, listening for other feelings behind the fear. Are you worried about how you will feel if he dies? Wife, I just can't imagine how I'm going to live without him. He's always been there for me, always. I'm going to start crying right now. So you're sad when you think of living without him. There is no one else beside him, besides him. He's all I have, you know? My daughter won't even talk to me. Nurse, it sounds like when you think of your daughter, you feel frustrated because you wish you had a different relationship with her. I wish I did, wife says, but she's just a selfish person. I don't know why I even bothered having kids. A lot of good that does me now. Nurse, it sounds to me like you might be somewhat angry and disappointed because you wanted more support from family during your husband's illness. Wife, yes, he's so sick. I don't know how I'm going to get through this alone. I haven't anyone, not even to talk to, except with you here now. Even he won't talk about it. Look at him. Husband remains silent and impassive. He doesn't say anything. Or then she says, he doesn't say anything. Nurse says, are you sad wishing the two of you could support each other and feel more connected? Yes, wife says. She pauses and then makes a request. Um... Talk to him the way that you talk to me, <laughs> nurse, wishing to clearly understand the need that is being addressed behind the woman's request. Are you wanting him to be listened to in a way that helps him express what he's feeling inside? Wife, yes, yes, that's exactly it. I want him to feel comfortable talking and I want to know what he's feeling. Using the nurse's guess, using the nurse's guess, the wife is able to first become aware what she wanted and then Find the words to articulate it. This is a key moment. Often it is difficult for people to identify what they want in a situation, even though they may know what they don't want. We see how clear, how a clear request, talk to him the way that you talk to me, is a gift that empowers the other person. The nurse is now able to act in a way she knows to be in harmony with the wife's wishes. This alters the atmosphere in the room. As the nurse and the wife as the nurse and the wife now work together, both in a compassionate mode. Nurse, turning to the husband. How do you feel when you hear what your wife has shared? Husband, I really love her. Nurse, are you glad to have the opportunity to talk about this with her? Husband, yes, we need to talk about it. Nurse, would you be willing to say how you're feeling about the cancer? Husband, after a brief silence. Not very good. The words good and bad are often used to describe feelings when people have yet, oh, this is the side note. Sorry, he says, not very good. The words good and bad are often used to describe feelings when people have yet to identify a specific emotion they're experiencing. Expressing his feelings more precisely would help him with the emotional connection he is seeking with his wife. Nurse, encouraging him to move toward more precision. Are you scared about dying? Husband, no, no, not scared. Notice the nurse's incorrect guess does not hamper the continued flow of dialogue. Nurse, do you feel angry about dying? Um, because this patient isn't able to verbalize his internal experience easily, the nurse continues to support him in the process. No, I'm not angry. Nurse, at this point, offering two incorrect guesses, the nurse decides to express her own feelings. Well, now I'm puzzled about what you may be feeling and wondering if you could tell me, husband, I reckon... I'm thinking how she'll do without me, nurse. Oh, are you worried that she may not be able to handle her life without you? Husband, yes, 
I'm worried she'll miss me, nurse. She is aware that dying patients often hang on due to worry over those that they are leaving behind. And patients sometimes need the reassurance that loved ones can accept their death before they can let themselves go. Do you want to hear how your wife feels when you say that? Husband, yes. Here, the wife joins the conversation in the continued presence of the nurse. The couple begins to express themselves openly to each other. In this dialogue, the wife begins with a compliment about the physical therapist. However, after a series of exchanges during which she felt empath empathically received, she is able to determine that what she really seeks is a deeper connection with her husband during his, this critical stage of their lives. Uh Oh, there's still, there's some exercises, almost done. So exercise five is differentiating receiving empathically from receiving to non-empathically. Okay, if you'd like an exercise to see whether we're all communicating about empathy, please circle the number in front of the statements in which the person B is responding empathically to what is going on with person A. Person A, number, or number one, person A. How could I do something so stupid? Person B. Nobody is person is perfect. You're too hard on yourself. Okay, so what am I doing again? Hold on. I like an extra. Please circle the number in front of the statements in which the person B is responding empathically to what is going on with person A. Okay, how could I do something so stupid? Nobody's perfect. You're too hard on yourself. Okay, that's not empathically. Okay. Person A says, if you ask me, we ought to ship all these in immigrants back to where they came from. Okay. Uh, person B says, do you really think that that would solve anything? Um, still doesn't feel like it to me. We're going to find out in a minute. It still feels like there's something like that we're not getting at the person's like uh, feeling about maybe, I don't know. Yeah, this is a little bit more difficult than I thought. But it doesn't feel right. I don't know how to say how, but it doesn't feel totally right. I feel like that could be even more empathic. Person A, you aren't God. Person B, are you feeling frustrated because you would like me to admit that there can be other ways of interpreting this matter? That feels pretty good to me. I don't know. Maybe there's a better one, but that one doesn't seem too bad. Because um, usually if I say you're not God, that's usually kind of what I would be feeling so okay number four person a i think that you take me for granted i wonder how you would manage without me person b that's not true i don't take you for granted yeah that's not addressing anything with a at all it's just them being defensive number five person a how could you say a thing like that to me person b are you feeling hurt because i said that that sounds good again who knows maybe it's not but that sounds good to me Person A, number six, I'm furious with my husband. He's never around when I need him. Person B, you think he should be around more than he is? That sounds good to me. Person A, I'm disgusted with how heavy I'm getting. Person B, perhaps jogging would help. <laughs> no, I don't think that would be a good one. <laughs> the thing is, again, this is sometimes what a neurodivergent person's brain goes to. They will say, they will go to their file, their bucket in their head that talks about um, like all things diet culture, all things fat, all things whatever. And their latest special interest or TikTok or something comes up might have been like how jogging can cure this particular thing or whatever, whatever it is. So they'll hear someone say that and then immediately go to their bucket and then like say it without really feeling like they can help it. At least I know I do that sometimes. And then I like after I blurted it, I'm like, shit. And I try to go back and then explain how, oh, that was just in a bucket. I'm not trying to step on you. Oh my God. Anyway. Um, number eight, person a, I've been a nervous wreck planning for my daughter's wedding. Her fiance's family's not helping about every day. They change their minds about the kind of wedding they would like. And person B says, so you're feeling nervous about how to make arrangements that would appreciate and would appreciate it if your future in-laws could be more aware of the complications that their indecision is creating for you. 
That sounds good to me. Person A, when my relatives come without letting me know ahead of time, I feel invaded. It reminds me how my parents used to disregard my needs and would plan things for me. Person B, I know how you feel. I used to feel that way too. That didn't address them. They just went to them. Though some people who are neurodivergent are attempting at empathy at that point. <laughs> it's good to know. Um yeah, because we're likening. That's actually how we're thinking. We're empathizing. Motherfucker. Okay, number 10, person A, I'm disappointed with your performance. I would have liked your department to double your production last month. Person B, I understand that you're disappointed, but we have had many absences due to illness. Something in me tells me that that could be a little bit better and that they will be in a defense match still. I feel like there needs to be something in that saying, uh, well, let's see. Um, they say here, I'll just do this one right now. Uh, he sees person B starting by focusing on person A's feelings, but then shifting to explaining. Maybe I should have said all the answers to it on the way, like when I originally was doing it. Um, number one. I see person B giving reassurance rather than empathically. Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to, well, yeah, I'll go through it. This is the very end. So if you don't care to listen to the other things, you can end it now because all I'm going to do right now um, before I start the next chapter is our answers. Um, the number one one was, how could I do something so stupid? Nobody's perfect. You're too hard on yourself. Uh, he didn't circle this one because he sees per person B giving reassurance rather than empathically receiving what person A is expressing. Number two was, if you ask me, we had to ship all these immigrants back to where they came from. I can't, it's hard for me to even say that sentence. I, I have to admit. Um, do you really think that would solve anything? He says that one is attempting to educate rather than empathically receive what they're expressing. Number three, you aren't God. And then are you feeling frustrated because you would like me to admit that there can be other ways of interpreting this matter? Number three, if you circled this, we're in agreement. I see person B empathetically receiving what person A is expressing. Number four, I think that you take me for granted. I wonder how you would manage without me. That's not true. I don't take you for granted. Four on here is, he, they're disagreeing and defending rather than empathically receiving what's going on. Five, how could you say a thing like that to me? Are you feeling hurt because I said that? Number five, it, person B is taking responsibility for person A's feelings rather than, ooh, rather than empathically receiving what is going on in person A, person B might have said, are you feeling hurt because you would have liked me to agree to do as you requested? Okay, I need to look at that one again. How could you say a thing like that to me? Are you feeling hurt because I said that? And the better one is, are you feeling hurt because you would have liked me to agree to do as, as you requested? Okay. And then number six is, I'm furious with my husband. He's never around when I need him. You think he should be around more than he is? Um, doo -doo -doo. If you circle that, that they were in partial agreement, I see person B receiving person A's thoughts. However, I believe we are connected more deeply when we receive the feelings and needs being expressed rather than the thought. I've always been a proponent for that. I just didn't know how to say it. As far as like, I always, I know there's a need to get to that feeling. Therefore, I would have preferred if person B had said, so you're feeling furious because you would like him to be a more, more around than what he is. Number seven, I'm disgusted with how heavy I'm getting. Perhaps jogging will help. I see person B giving advice rather than empathically receiving what is going on for person A. Person A, I've been a nervous wreck planning for my daughter's wedding. Her fiance's family's not helping. About every day, they change their minds about what kind of wedding they would like. So you're feeling nervous about how to make arrangements that would appreciate it and would appreciate if your future in-laws could be more aware of the complications their indecisions are creating for you. 
Oh, I see person B assuming that he, she has understood and talking about his or her own feelings rather than empathically receiving what's going on on. Um, oh, wait, that's the next one. I'm sorry. I was like really confused because I thought that was a really good one. Okay. I see person B giving advice. No. Okay. Hold on. Which one am I on? Hold on. Oh, the, the jogging one. Okay. Eight. Oh, I read the wrong one here. The wedding and then eight here. Yeah. So that one was good. The wedding one was good. Sorry, guys. Number. Yes, that was good. Okay. Number nine. When my relatives come without letting me know ahead of time, I feel invaded. It reminds me of how my parents used to re, uh, used to disregard my needs and would plan things for me. I know how you feel. I used to feel that way too. This uh, person be assuming he or she is understood and talking about his own, her own feelings rather than empathically receiving what's going on for person A. The next one on number 10, I'm disappointed with your performance. I would have liked your department to double your production last month. Um, I understand that you're disappointed, but we have had many um, absences due to illness. That just sounds like an excuse. Number 10, I see person B starting by focusing on person A's feelings, but then shifting to explaining. Okay. That is chapter seven. Yay. I will be doing chapter eight in just a few minutes. I'm going to get some water. So stick with me and I'll see you later. Mwah.